Black Tree Crime is a podcast that researches and discusses murders committed by black offenders. It is a podcast that anyone and everyone is welcome to enjoy, but it may not be enjoyed by anyone and everyone. So listener discretion is advised. Now, without further ado, this is Black Tree Crime. Do not go gentle into that good night. Hello, everyone. Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm Kayla. And I'm Kristen. And welcome to Black True Crime. Uh, If this is your first time here at the show, welcome and hello. Hi. Come on in. Take a seat. Relax. (laughs) Yeah, you know. Today's case is something that honestly had my adrenaline rushing before I pushed play. And it's still kind of pumping. And I'm really excited about it. Okay. Mm-hmm. If you guys know anything, you probably already know who we're covering since you clicked on this episode. But if you know anything about them, it's just it's fucking mind blowing. So let's just get into it because this might be a longer one. We're going to kind of try to keep it condensed. But, you know, I got to give you what I can give you, which is everything. look at my face. I know. Kristen, how about you just hush and just fucking be here? I'm here. <laughs> OK, so are you ready to get started? So still. Yes. OK. Richmond, Virginia in the 70s was full of middle class families. Some were upper middle and some were lower, but either way, all were affected by the evils of the time. Racism, the drug epidemic, and a group of brothers who violently robbed and killed their way through the city. Join us as we discuss three sons that only a mother could love. The Briley brothers. Ooh, Kayla. Okay, guys, here we go. Linwood Earl Briley was born in 1954, and he was the oldest. He was nice and extremely intelligent. His own dad said he thinks he was actually a genius. So he was definitely the thinker out of the two that we see right now. And Linwood is the one on the left. Girl, I wouldn't have guessed that. (laughs) What? I would not have guessed that he was the smart one. Oh, the one on the left? Yeah, I was thinking the one with the fro. Oh, Good to know. Yeah. Well, the one with the fro is named James Durrell Briley, who went by JB, and he was born on June 6, 1956. He hmm. wasn't that smart. But before we get into him, Kristen, what happened in black history in 1954? Okay. So. Let's get into it. Nothing really happened in 1954 that I wanted to cover, but I did want to cover a man who lived until he was 89 years old and died in 1955. So that means he was born in 1866. Hmm. This man's name is Matthew Henson. Mm. Now, Matthew Henson is an American explorer, and what he's known for is going on the trip to the North Pole with Robert Piercy. Robert Peary, sorry. Oh, shit. I think we covered him before. I mean, I think we, no, I think we talked about him briefly in another episode. It was like a flyover inclusion in that year. Yeah, that was when I was like just going through bullet points of different Mm -hmm, stuff that happened. mm -hmm. So, yeah. So Matthew Henson was honestly just a baller. Like (laughs) a lot of stuff happened to him when he was younger. He actually was born to these free black people um, that were working as sharecroppers in Maryland. They died when he was really, really young. So he actually had to move to Washington, D.C. to stay with his uncle Mm. until he was 12. Then his uncle died. So Mm. then he moved. I know. Just mad death. Poor baby. I know. And then he moved to Be More. Shout out Be More, Baltimore. You already know. They hate when we say that. Someone literally wrote a review. It was like a two-star review. And was like, fuck them. Their fucking Baltimore accent is trash. Bitch, your mama's trash, ho. Like, you you know it was a joke. You mad? When we said it. Oh, my mother, you mad? <laughs> Kristen, I won't do this with you today. I won't do this with Who you. Who cares? Anyway. <laughs> anyway, so he had to um, eventually go to Baltimore, and that's where he started working as a cabin boy on this ship called Katie Hines. Mm. A ton of stuff happened on that ship. He basically grew into kind of a young man. The captain of the ship taught him how to read and write. Um, But eventually down the road, he actually was working at a D.C. clothing store in in November 1887. And that's where he met Commander Robert Peary. 
If you want to know more, tune into our TikToks. This will be coming up soon. I just posted one, Kayla. So I was okay. about to look you in your face and say, "Bitch, stop telling people something." I just posted one. Okay, I just okay. posted one. I'm sending it to you today. Awesome. But yes, tune in for more. Well, thank you, sister, for that quick trip down history lane. Of course. Back to these guys. So James or JB, he wasn't the smartest. Like I said, he was more mouth from mm-hmm. the people that knew him. And he was more spontaneous, basically saying, I'm just going to decide something in the moment and do it in the fucking moment. He gives me that vibe. Mm-hmm. Little wild tang. Little wild child. Anthony, who was the youngest, he actually was like the follower, obviously. You know, usually the youngest is, but he took that role and ran with it, okay? Mm. He looked up to his brothers like a father figure. It was just really deep. Are you going to show him? Uh, I don't have a picture of him as a like a younger person, but I will show you a picture of him later. Okay. Their parents, who were James and Bertha Riley, were hardworking class citizens, okay? I'm actually going to show you guys the house that they grew up in. And when you see the house, you're going to be like, we always assume if you come from a good place, you shouldn't be acting a fool. But that's not always the case. Mm. Hey, Mama Bertha. Kristen, that's the wrong picture. <laughs> <laughs> God. Wow. She looks like the old. That's like the original Medea. That's what she looks like. Mm hmm. A lot of this case, Kristen, reminds me of things that I've heard of in other cases and stuff like that. Honestly, it's crazy. TV shows have taken like aspects of this case, all of it. So wow. we're going to get okay, to I it. I was literally going to say this house almost looks like the Family Matters house. This and it was a nice house. Yeah. The family was giving that, you know, they're like I said, their mom and dad were working. Bertha worked at the Virginia Union University. You guys saw her as a food service manager. And she was loved by everybody in the community. Like mm-hmm. she was the one that would go out of her way to take care of everybody and just built a, a real rapport. And then the father, James, he worked for the city laying pipes. Kristen, what do you have to say? Come on, James. Like, he looks like he's a hardworking man. Mm -hmm. He used to be attractive. He got his big old woman right next to him, strong. (laughs) And they're just doing the doggone thing in Richmond, Virginia. They were. They were living it up with their three sons. And James was more on the quiet side, okay? So Bertha was like the you know, type A, he was definitely type B. And he kind of spent a lot of time away from his family. Even when he wasn't working, when he would come home, he would lock himself into his room, hmm, which is super, you super doing, weird. James? You know, men. That's, that's the excuse for what it was back in the 60s and 70s, just men. Hmm. By the time the boys were teenagers, Bertha had left their father, leaving the sons with James. So the reason that they divorced, obviously a lot of reasons go into it, but the main reason was that the boys really started, I guess, to misbehave at this time. And it was just causing a lot of friction between the mom and the dad. And it just, you know, disintegrated as a relationship. That sucks. Like, can you imagine the child, the children that you bore out of your own womb are now causing your marriage to deteriorate? Yeah, like they're acting so horribly that you guys can't even love each other or be together you know that's fucked up that is with bertha leaving the house this really changed the dynamic within the house and the dynamic within the boys so they were already like on some weird path to doing whatever the fuck they were doing because at first they were very very helpful they would help people in their neighborhoods just go out of their way to like be good people but once their mom left it was just like fuck all that and Mm. they started getting into more creepy things like exotic pets. So they would have tarantulas and scorpions and piranhas in their house. And they even had pythons. Okay. Mm -mm. And obviously in order to feed all these animals, you have to have other animals to feed them with. So they had a lot of mice on hand and the boys loved watching the python eat the mice. I don't know what the fuck they got that from. How they even got introduced to being attracted to something like that but it happened and they also fetish material it's giving they got a hold of a snuff film somewhere because be honestly because back in the 70s snuff films were like prevalent like people were making them so i believe it i would not be fucking surprised at all they also had regular pets too so they had a few dobermans and if you guys don't know what they are they're like dogs with the big like black dogs Mm -hmm, with the pointy ears yeah short 
um, hair, Mm -hmm. stuff like that. And for entertainment, they would sometimes throw a live cat at the Dobermans and just watch them tear it apart. No. I'm not a cat person, but if I catch somebody doing some shit like this to a cat, I'm going to jail. I'm about to say animal abuse, sometimes it's worse than human abuse. Sometimes? (laughs) majority of the time no majority of the time fuck humans we ruin everything and (laughs) animals are just trying to make it literally they're just trying to make it out alive screw you michael vick you know screw you (laughs) so they really really enjoyed this horrific like hell hellish hellish (laughs) hellish action Mm -hmm. and even started to embody the aggression and like the violence they were watching and by the age of 16 years old, Linwood Briley would commit his first murder. Wow, that's super freaking young. It's too young. I mean, never should you commit a murder. But at 16, on January 28th, 1971, Orlean Christian was doing laundry outside in her yard. And back then, some people were still like hanging their clothes up to dry. So that's what mm-hmm. she was doing. In the same moment, Linwood was looking out of his bedroom window and happened to spot her. He then looked over at his 22 caliber rifle hanging on his wall and happened to take it down. He pointed it out the window and shot Orlean in the back of the neck. Wow. I mean, brutal. First of all, who just has a gun hanging up in a room as a 16-year-old? A lot of root of the caucus children today, but also back then, probably just a lot of people in general. That's sad. I cannot believe that's such a cowardly move. He was like, hmm, let's see what Guan and Terrible. just shot her. And I'm like, she's right next door. Your neighbor. Did you even think about that? Dumbass. Unfortunately, she died right there in her yard. And her family assumed she just died of some type of like natural cause or heart attack because she was elderly. So they thought nothing of it and just started to plan her funeral. Did they now, not I, see the bullet wound in the back of her neck? Mm, if you're not looking for something, it could just, you know, that's why people ignore red flags so easily, because if you're not looking for them, they may not seem like red flags at the time. That's a damn shame, Kayla. There was blood everywhere, <laughs> I bet. Like, I'm confused. That's what I'm saying. I don't know what type of a 22. That's a small. It's bullet, very small. So it may not have left a bunch, a big hole and it may, may not have made her bleed out a lot. Who knows? But mm-hmm. I do know from what I saw, there was two reports of how it was discovered that she was actually murdered. So in the Killer Siblings documentary that I watched, they claimed that when the funeral director went to prepare Orlean's body, he noticed a small hole in the back of her neck. And that's mm-hmm. when, you know, he's, he realized there was a bullet, whatever. But I also read that the family noticed during the actual viewing of her body, like during her funeral. So I'm hoping it's the first one. I'm praying to God. <laughs> Because how the heck you see the back of her neck anyway while you're and, viewing her? And you know how newspapers and stuff try to be salacious. So they probably just made that shit up to be like, mm-hmm. as they're saying their last goodbyes, they realize. They a small wound You know what I'm saying? Terrible. On the back of her neck. So investigators went out to investigate and one named James Garday took a board, like a wooden board with him and put a hole in it. And he held it up, I guess, mathematically what they could figure out where she was standing when she got shot. And he kind of just held it right there and went around in a circle to figure out where it could have possibly come from. So up, down, all around. And then boom, he landed on Linwood's window. Mm. His excuse, Linwood's excuse, is that it was an accident and that he was just shooting at squirrels and she just happened to get hit. Since he was 16 and probably like fucking acting his ass off, just crying, you know, whatever, he got off with that. And he was only charged with manslaughter and spent one year in juvie Wow. for cold-blooded murder. I mean, just like that. It was easy as sticking a gun out the window and popping it off. And he gets one year. One year, Kristen. Sad. And guess who wanted to be just like his big brother? James! The second oldest. In 1972, James was 16 and decided to rob a convenience store. He was chased down by police who he decided to shoot at. And Mm -hmm. the cops survived and did, like, shoot at him back. But James was arrested and sent to juvie for that. And he was released after one year. I mean, (laughs) I don't get it. (laughs) Like, if that's what y'all want to do. It's just not rehabilitation based. Like you lock somebody up and then guess what he did when he came out? The Became same a better thing. 
a better criminal. Mm-hmm. It's just terrible. I don't get the system. It hasn't changed in the sense of help. It just really hasn't overall. Yeah. In 1973, both brothers were out of juvie and ready to run it the fuck up in the streets. So now they were doing drugs. They were selling drugs, robbing people, all that shit. They were literally a little gang. Mm. They Good have. <laughs> yes. They had a fourth member, and that member was 16-year-old Duncan Meekins. So Duncan is on the far right. Um, Right next to him is Anthony. Right next to him is James. And then that's Linwood on the end. I mean, these brothers have some good hair. That's the only thing I'll ever give them. Incredible hair. Incredible hair. And if my job was, like, literally to be able to tell them apart, I wouldn't be able to, bitch. I would fail miserably. They look like carbon copies. Except for the oldest one with the sideburns <laughs> from right to here. <laughs> Interesting look, my guy. So Duncan was introduced to the group by Linwood. I guess he was one of their neighbors as well. And all three bro- brothers treated him like he was blood too. Mm-hmm. Duncan admired them and thought like all the fucked up shit that they were doing was hella cool. And he wanted to be a part of it. Okay. So where's your daddy, Duncan? I was like, maybe it's giving only child and just want to be a part of something, you know? Yeah, I can see that. mm -hmm. So what they do is they would drink together, get high together, and then decide who their target was going to be that night, their target, you know, to rob. Soon the group started bringing home TVs, jewelry, money, even guns, all under their father's roof, by the way. And where the heck is James? In the room. Chris, James is... In his room, bitch, doesn't want any parts of what's going on downstairs, okay? Wow. And we're going to get more into that. Okay. James had completely lost control at this point. Any control that he may have had over the kids when they were younger was just fucking evaporated. And at this point, he was basically doing what they were telling him to do. Mm. It could never be me. I'll, How about to say? I'll take us both out <laughs> before I'm taking I'm, orders for my child out of fear. I'm just thinking about our dad. He would die. Chris, Before he, he would just sit there and let us run him. He'd really, he'd literally chew his own hand off. His <laughs> ego would never let him let us tell him a thing. Never do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so at this point, they completely lost any good that was in them before their mother left, and at this point, it will only get worse. I have a question. Yes. Do you think she came to visit them, or do you know? I don't know if she was super active in their lives or anything like that, but from what I could see, she was not. Mm-hmm. All right. So now we're about to get into the terribleness. Let's take a little break, sister. Let's take a little break. 